everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. And I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. And some urban legends. Please check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And on our website, we also have a cool little tip jar, so if you want to swing by there and help out the show and leave us a tip, we'll give you a shout-out on the show. Speaking of shout-outs, we actually have a new patron this week, Ooh. James. James, thank Thanks you Thanks for joining much, us. Welcome to the show. And don't forget, I am going to be in Dallas this weekend for the True Crime Podcast Festival. Ooh. That is the 26th through the 28th. August 26th to 28th. Uh, I'm excited for Lauren to be there. I think it's going to be great. So if you're going to be in the Dallas area, you probably should swing by there. Get your tickets. You just visit their website, get the tickets, go see Lauren, say hi. Because, you know, obviously that's the only reason anybody's going to go is for Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm only teasing. So since Lauren is headed to Dallas this week, we we chose a pretty gnarly Dallas case. So this week's episode is about Charles Frederick Albright, who is also known as the Eyeball Killer. Now, he was an American serial killer from Dallas, Texas, who was convicted of killing one woman and suspected of killing two others in 1991. And as we all know, probably there's a few more that we could squeeze in there. Probably. But these are ones that we can pretty much determine that he was involved in. So Albright was born in Amarillo, Texas, but his parents gave him up for adoption. In 1933, when he was three weeks old, he was adopted from an orphanage by Dell and Fred Albright. The Albrights lived in the all-white middle-class neighborhood of Oak Cliff, then a beautiful residential area across the river from downtown. According to a 1993 article in Texas Monthly by Skip Hollingsworth, who I'm a big fan of, by the way. I like Skip. Titled, See No Evil... He was known as the most good-natured, eager-to-please of children, a precocious boy who would do just about anything, name all the constellations in the sky, catch snakes without getting bit, even perform a tap dance routine on stage at the famous Texas Theater. Charlie was like a Pied Piper to the rest of us kids, a childhood friend recalled. We always wanted to see what he would do next. He was just so much damn fun. Charles proved early on to be bright and maybe even brilliant. He skipped ahead two grades in school and seemed to be a natural leader among his peers. At home, though, life with his mother proved unsettling. That's putting it lightly, because throughout Charles' childhood, Dale pushed him to excel in all areas such as forcing him awake at dawn each day to practice piano and punished him harshly for odd infractions, things like tying him to his bed for refusing to nap. Think about that for a minute. That's abusive. Like, now that would be considered child abuse. Exactly. Well, Dale also changed Charles's clothes several times a day for fear he'd get infected by something unclean. So she was constantly worried about something happening. And understand, she couldn't have children, and this was her only child. You know, afraid that he might, you know, get sick or something. She was even afraid that he might touch dog feces and get polio. She took him to the Parkland Hospital to see the polio patients locked in huge iron lungs. You can spend the rest of your life here, Dale would solemnly tell her son. I mean, she would literally like, think about that for a minute. You're going to go make your child look at these horrific situations just to scare the shit out of him? Yeah. Now, occasionally as well, Dale prettied up her son in girls' dresses and instructed him to play with dolls. He was also an impulsive child and would always manage to get out of the yard behind where his mother worked. So she searched the fence and found no openings, but later learned he would actually wait for people passing by and, and simply would ask them to lift him over. Like, hey, can you help me lift me over the fence? And people would actually lift him over the fence. So to prevent this, Della actually ended up tying him to the porch to keep him away from the fence. That's crazy. Like a dog. Exactly. So uh, dress him up in girls' dress clothes, him up in girls play clothing. dolls, oh my take gosh. him to the hospital and look at iron lungs. Now, obviously, none of this is going to excuse any of his behaviors later on in life, but it is an explanation as to why maybe he became what he did. So Dell's strange behavior did not go unnoticed by those around her. No one could ever remember her buying herself a new dress. She wore a scarf over her head 
and old drabby clothes from Goodwill. The family was far from poor, but Dell apparently just liked to look like that. As a teenager, Charles got a rifle and took to picking off birds and rabbits. Dell enrolled him in a mail-order taxidermy course, the Northwestern School of Taxidermy, taught by Professor J.W. Elwood. Mother and son then took to skinning, treating, and stuffing the cadavers together. She showed him how to use all the tools, the knife used to cut the skull, the little spoon used to scoop out the brains, the scalpel required to cut away the eyes from their sockets, the forceps used to pull out the eyes. She even skinned the first bird for him, teaching him not to cut too deep. According to Crime Feed, almost immediately, Charles became obsessed with removing the creature's eyes. He would even visit taxidermy shops and spend hours poring over the cases of glass eyeballs, dreaming of the perfect set to use for each display. Yeah, dreaming is what he did, but the taxidermist's eyes were way too expensive, and his frugal mother would say, there's a way better, cheaper way to do this. Yeah. So she would open her sewing kit, look for exactly what she needed, and get to work. And then she and her son would place the birds in these oak china cabinets in the front of the house. They were, indeed, Charles Albright's first work of art, just as Mail Order Booklet had promised. He got this Mail Order taxidermy thing, and everything so far is working out. Now, everyone who came by the house would peer into the cabinet to see what he had done, and there, peering back, would be his birds, beautiful, lifelike, and blind. The birds had no eyes. Instead, sewn tightly against their delicate feathered faces were two dark buttons or whatever buttons they could come up with. Now, psychologists later theorized that forbidding Albright to use eyes on his animals played a part in forming his criminal pathology. At age 13, he was already a petty thief and was arrested for aggravated assault. I'm assuming due to his age, those records are sealed, so I couldn't find in my research who he assaulted or what he stole. But by age 14, Dell and Fred actually purchased a piece of property for in their neighborhood and gave it to him. So 13, he's a thief arrested for all this. Oh, hey, mom, dad, let's just buy our son a piece of property. But he's a lord now. But Albright turned around and sold it to buy more lots. And the Dallas Times Herald published a story about him under the headline, World's Youngest Real Estate Man Amasses Nest Egg for College. And can't afford eyes. Because Dell was a teacher, she pushed Albright through school, and at age 15, he graduated from high school and enrolled in North Texas University. He expressed an interest in training as a medical doctor and a surgeon. He undertook pre-med training, but failed to complete it. Also at age 15, he had his first encounter with a prostitute, and she gave him crabs. Not the kind you eat at a restaurant. Dell chauffeured Albright around on dates and lectured her son not to try anything untoward with the girl he went out with. She even called his date's parents to tell them her son would behave himself. She was the only person who took him on these dates. She didn't let his father or even the girl's parents drive them around. But at age 16, Albright stole $380 from a cash register and after a police investigation, they found two handguns and a rifle worth over $111. Once again, Dell tried to intervene, trying to reimburse the shop owner, trying to act as her son's lawyer, and even offering to do his jail time for him. That didn't work out. He ended up spending a year in jail. And are we noticing something weird about Dell and her son's relationship yet? Well, hold on a second. Just think about this for a minute. So he was an only child adopted. Dell obviously is not his real mother, so he gets adopted. So there's a reason that she's adopting because she couldn't have kids or something. I'm was it was it? Did you find anything on? I could not find any if they're they no. unable to have children or not. So he's adopted. He's an only child. So my thing that I'm thinking is she wanted to have like multiple children. So in her mind, she was looking at him, and I think maybe she had some mental health problems to where she was looking at him as, okay, here's my son. He can be my daughter, and I'm going to do everything to protect him. So it's kind of like that big Bugs Bunny cartoon where it's, I'm going to hug him and squeeze him and call him George. So (laughs) 
you know, it's one of those things where it's like, wow, she's just doing a lot of crazy stuff to protect the child. And I always wondered, and I can't see in here, where was the father? How did he feel about any of this? Or did he even know? I don't think he had much to do with the goings-ons in the house. Yeah, he must have just been the worker in the family. So um, you want to take a quick break? Yeah, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Thank you. Okay, so after Albright's release from jail, he attended Arkansas State Teachers College and majored in pre-med studies. That didn't take him long to become one of the school's most popular students. You know, he was remarkably well-rounded. He was president of the French Club, uh, business manager of the yearbook, member of the school choir, halfback of the football team. And when he signed up for a drawing course, the art professor was so impressed with his good looks that he made him the class model. But one thing his classmates thought was odd, while there, his classmates remembered the decorations he used as a prank. Um, These were cutouts of a girl's almond-shaped eyes. Now, Albright had clipped out the pictures of his friend's ex-girlfriend's eyes on photos and plastered them all over the dorm room walls, the ceilings, and even in the men's bathroom. Now, these pictures were taken out of the trash can. The guy had broken up with the girl... And threw all her pictures in the trash can. And then Albright got all the pictures, cut out all the eyes, and put them everywhere. Creepy. Totally creepy. Are you getting like an almost like multiple personality kind of thing going on? I did kind of sense that researching this. He wasn't diagnosed with it, but it just seems odd. So Albright, although very smart, did not get good grades in college. Actually, he failed a few courses, but that was no matter. So he snuck into the school office, filched some report cards from a desk, filled them in with all A's, and proudly showed them to his parents. His teachers and principals' signatures perfectly forged. So he, wait a minute, so he he manipulated his grades? Oh, yeah. I didn't see that part. But after being found with stolen items, he was expelled from the college but was not prosecuted. Apparently unfazed, he falsified a degree. Shit, why not? He stole documents and forged signatures, giving himself a fictitious bachelor's and master's degree. You know, that's a real cheap way to go through college, though. If you could just figure that out, like you enroll and get all that stuff done and just manipulate the grades and then just, you know, give all, make your fake documents and, hey, I'm a, I have a master's degree at podcasting. <laughs> Is that even a thing? Can you go to I school don't for think podcasting? So. I'm just curious because if you go to school for podcasting, I mean, you would do wonderful there. I wouldn't because I'm not good at school. Now, at this point, Albright is obviously he's out of he's out of college and he's moved on with his bachelor's and master's degree. And he did marry his college girlfriend and they had a daughter. But in 1975, they separated but did not actually officially divorce until 1987. So 12 years after they got married, they're divorced, even though it didn't it didn't last that long. Now, Albright used his falsified degrees that Lauren talked about earlier to get a job as a high school teacher. Think about that. You have students in this guy's class. That's just creepy in my brain. He also held jobs as a football coach and a baseball bat manufacturer. But like anything else, when you lie, he was eventually found out. And two years later, he received probation for falsifying these official records. He blew through many different jobs over the next few years, never staying at a job for more than three months or so. He worked as a designer for a company that built airplanes. He worked as an illustrator for a patent company. He was a well-regarded carpenter. He collected wine bottles from the famous Il Sorrento restaurant in Dallas, hoping to start his own winery. After visiting a friend at a beauty salon in a Sanger Harris department store, Albright promptly went off to beauty school, got his beautician's license, and then persuaded the salon to hire him with no experience at all as a stylist. <laughs> this guy's got it all, man. He knows what to do. Albright took to calling himself Mr. Charles and would spend at least an hour with each woman to get her hair exactly right. Now, referring back to the Texas Monthly article that Lauren mentioned earlier, when Albright told his stylist friend that he was also an accomplished artist, the friend paid him $250 to paint a picture of his wife. Now, Albright was indeed a good painter. I mean, he was self-taught, 
and he, he didn't have a fake degree in it, but he was self-taught. Um, he had won a, actually won a prize at the Texas State Fair for his portrait of a dark-haired woman in a long green gown. And his goal, he said, was to be like Dimitri Vail, the famous portrait artist of Dallas. Now, Albright worked for weeks on the wife, the woman's painting, without finishing. He insisted that he needed to keep working on one special feature, the most difficult part of the painting. Now, tired of waiting, the friend decided to go to Albright's house to look at the work in progress. Now, while he was there, in the living room was this six-by-three-foot portrait. It was richly colored. I mean, it was remarkably realistic. And the woman's hair, her mouth, her nose, her ears, her neck, everything was finished. Well, not everything, because the stylist stared curiously at the wife's painting, and in the center of the wife's face were two round white holes. Creepy? That would actually just look creepy. Yeah. Because here's this big painting, and it's done, this beautiful woman there, and it's your wife, who you kind of recognize, but there's white holes where the eye should be. Now, after all this time, Albright hadn't even begun working on the eyes. I mean, it was as if something held him back, as if he preferred the portrait to remain as it was on his living room easel. Charles asked the friend, when are you going to paint the eyes? When I'm ready to, Albright replied. And months later, Albright finally painted the eyes. He then painted them again to get them just right. And he painted the proper shadows under the eyelashes. He gave the eyelids just the right droop on the corners. He shaded the eyeballs to make them look perfectly round. And when Albright was finished, his friend could not believe how well this painting had turned out. It was, he realized, a mesmerizing portrait, especially the eyes. Now, his wife's eyes were so perfectly recreated that they seemed to follow a person across the room. Oh, I hate paintings like that. But they say that that's the part of the, you know, when, when they paint the eyes so perfectly that it follows you across the room, that that means that that is the way it's supposed to be. Ugh, okay, it it is eerie. Now, it's not like the Scooby-Doo when they would walk and then the eyes would move. No. These eyes didn't actually move. They didn't follow you for real. But it wasn't like a Scooby-Doo portrait. It was like a real portrait where they – it just appears that they follow you. Well, in 1980, he was sent back to prison after pleading guilty to stealing a miter saw and other items openly from a Dallas store. He served six months. After he got out again, he moved back to his old neighborhood near his parents and began to befriend and gain the trust of his neighbors. See, Dell had made sure that none of the neighbors knew anything about Albright's criminal activity. Gotta look the part. Then there was no internet back then and whatnot, so she had just made sure that nobody knew anything. The crimes escalated in 1981, though, when Albright, who regularly babysat the kids in the neighborhood, was caught molesting a nine-year-old girl. Hard to hide that. Despite pleading guilty, he merely received probation. That part makes my blood boil. Also in 1981, Dell passed away, and Albright traveled to meet his birth mother. Nothing is really known about how it went when, Al when Albright met his birth mother, other than he found out that she was not the brilliant lawyer or the prostitute that his adopted mother described. So apparently his whole life, Dell was telling him two different stories. One was that his birth mother was a brilliant lawyer and the other was that his birth mother was a prostitute. She was actually just a regular woman. She was a nurse, just a normal lady. I wonder why Dell would lie, like make up those lies it's so it's so odd i think she just wanted to make sure that she portrayed the idea that whether she was good or she was bad she didn't want her son right like dell i've got to be the only person in charles life because i've got to protect him i have to make sure that everything is safe i think dell had a lot of issues on her own and i think he was sort of the he was sort of like her i don't know maybe her thing to take her mind off of it a thing that she could control in her life Right. In my, in my own mind. That's what I saw through everything that I looked into. That's just, it, Dell just seemed all in all like a good person, but she definitely loved him very much and she wanted to protect him, but she wanted to also make sure that she was the only, you know, whatever. It's kind of creepy, honestly. Yeah. So in 1984, Charles applied to be a leader in the Boy Scouts of America, but he was rejected. Now this is probably because of the whole molesting a child thing a few years back. Can't imagine that that would be a, you know, sort of a prerequisite. <laughs> now, four years later, Albright moved in with a girlfriend. Her name was Dixie and took up an interest in 
prostitutes. Now, he started seeing these prostitutes in these real seedy areas of Dallas. Dixie paid most of the bills and supported the couple. Even though Albright had a job, he was delivering newspapers. Now, the paper delivery route, many believe, may have only been a cover for his more nefarious activity. See, in the delivery routes, it gave him an excuse to be out late night, early morning time. Right, yeah. So it wasn't, you know, he had to kind of get there and get the papers and do all the stuff and get them ready. So this could have been, you know, really a cover. Now, around 1990, Albright started to show some really strange behaviors. I mean, he started drawing pictures of mutilated women. He was also mowing <laughs> – this one I – I know it's it's wacky, but it's the truth. He was also mowing his lawn in his underwear, and he was collecting serial killer books. Now I'm going to be honest. Be honest here. We have a lot of serial killer books, and I have one time. One time I mowed the grass in my underwear, and that's only. I mean, I, but I mean that's not like I'm wearing boxers. It look like shorts, so it doesn't really matter. But it just, if somebody were to like knock on the door and walk through the house and see all the serial killer books and I'm mowing the yard out back, that could look a little <laughs> suspicious. You're right. It would. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, it's so funny because there's like one laying on our table. One of our patrons sent us, you know, a collection of serial killer books and there's one on the table that I'm actually flipping through right now. And I have to say it, it it's weird if people come over and there's, they look at the table and say, like, what the f- <laughs> Cause not, I mean, not everybody. I mean, everybody kind of knows what we do, but nobody knows, like, you know, they haven't really been in the studio and seen some of the things. So it could look a little suspicious. So, so on December 13th of 1990, the body of 33 year old Mary Lou Pratt, a well known sex worker in the Dallas area, was found murdered in an undeveloped lower class area of far south Dallas. Mary Lou was found naked except for a t shirt and a bra which had been pushed up over her breasts. Her eyes were shut, her face and chest were badly bruised. Apparently, the killer had thought it best to beat her to a bloody pulp before firing a forty-four caliber bullet into her head. According to the Texas Monthly article, while it was not unusual for the, quote, whores of Oak Cliff, as the police called them, To get their share of beatings, almost nightly, a girl would complain about a trick jumping bad on her, punching her, kicking her, even trying to run her over with a car. For a whore to be murdered was unusual, especially when it happened to be someone as well-liked as Mary Pratt. Mary wasn't one of the brazen hookers who stood in the street and flagged down tricks, because she rarely had any extra spending money The money she got usually went for drugs. She never bought sexy clothes. Standing quietly in her corner, she wore blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a small t-shirt that showed off her breasts. Occasionally, at the end of the night, she asked one of her regulars to drive her to her parents' home in South Dallas, in a suburb of Lancaster. Mary's parents, older and retired, never knew about her other life. They would call out goodnight as she climbed into her childhood bed. Now, keep in mind, all of that is literally quoted from an article, and it's in the 90s. I'm not saying whores and yeah, exactly. whatnot. But that's quoted in an article. We want to make sure that everybody knows that that's clear. Um, and obviously, when you're quoting an article, you want to make sure you quote it exactly how it's printed. But, you know, it's one of those, here's this young girl who lives with the grandparents. Like, and that the, the reason it's important. Her parents, not grandparents. I'm sorry, her parents. Um, the reason it's important to know that she climbed into a childhood bed because this is like – you can just picture this kid room and here's this girl going home to this room. And it, it kind of like, I don't know, it just makes her like human. It like humanizes her to my, in my eye. So, and her parents had no idea. So it's like, you know, now, now when all of this comes out, we know this, you know, this, this horrible side uh, of what she was dealing with and the things she was going through, but her family had no idea, you know, what she was struggling with or what she was actually doing. To them, I mean, obviously, like I said, she was just a child, so to speak, in their eyes. So Mary Lou's case was considered a body dump case, meaning she was killed elsewhere and her body was dumped where it was found. And these cases are notoriously harder to solve. It's for obvious reasons. I mean, there's no murder scene. There's no weapon. And in Mary Lou's case, there was apparently, allegedly, no witnesses, no murder weapon. No, There was very little forensic evidence. There were no fingerprints. And no apparent motive. 
Homicide detectives John Westphalen and Stan McNair of the Dallas Police Department were assigned the case. First order of business was to watch the autopsy of Mary Lou Pratt. This gave them the exact cause of death. They watched as Dr. Elizabeth Peacock noted the needle tracks in Pratt's arm, the Playboy bunny tattoo on her chest, and the bullet hole in her head. She opened Pratt's right eyelid, then she opened the left. My God, she exclaimed, they're gone. There were no eyeballs, no tissue, nothing. Mary Lou's eyes had been cut out and removed so carefully that her upper and lower eyelids were left undisturbed. So who would so brutally murder this woman, beat her, and then shoot her in the head with a forty-four caliber gun, and then so gently and meticulously cut out her eyeballs? Now, I think we might already know the answer to that question. Well, it wasn't just cut out the eyeballs. I mean, these things were like almost surgically removed. Yes. That's what they said. It was, it was so precise. That was the part that really boggled everyone's mind. So Detective Westphalen contacted the FBI's Violent Crime Apprehension Program Unit. Now, through its computers, the FBI keeps data on the nation's most unusual, depraved mutilations, bodies chopped up, organs removed, even eyes punctured with a knife as a result of frenzied attacks. But an FBI agent told Detective Westphalen that he found no listing anywhere of such a surgically precise cutting. But as bizarre as this case was... The authorities could find no leads and, again, no witnesses, nothing. And as we all know, when that happens, the case goes cold really quick. Think about that for a minute. You've got this woman who's a street worker. Um, she's murdered. They have nothing to go on. And so it's like, okay, well, we'll just wait and see if something happens. But two months later, Susan Beth Peterson was found murdered in the exact same way. Shot in the back of the head, eyes cut out. Precision cut. Susan was found on the same street that Mary Lou Pratt was found on. She was nearly nude, but had actually been shot three times in the top of her head, in her left breast, and in the back of her head. The third and final slaying took place a month later on March 19, 1991. Shirley Elizabeth Williams, another prostitute, was found in the same area with the same M.O., Although Albright changed his pattern with William's murder, his first two victims were white and he discarded their bodies on an out-of-the-way thoroughfare. Williams was black. Albright dumped her naked, eyeless corpse on a residential street. Near a school. Children walking to school initially spotted her. Her eyes had been removed, just like the previous two victims, and she had been badly beaten. She had facial bruises and a broken nose and had been shot in the face and through the top of the head. Actually, Albright had bungled the eye removal this time. He got them out, but left a broken blade of an X-Acto knife in Shirley's skin. Which gives obviously gives investigators something to know that, okay, well, now we something know... Something to work with. Exactly. We know that they're using an X-Acto knife, but something must have rushed him or something. He, he obviously goofed, and I guess they found it. The little tip of the blade was stuck in the bone. Yeah. So somehow the bone, it just, it just broke off into it. The press reported a serial killer of prostitutes at work. Now, of course, this is going to send the local sex workers into a reasonable panic, which makes perfect sense. Many of them talked about rough encounters with a muscular white guy who had salt and pepper hair and drove a dark colored station wagon. One victim said he raped her. Another said he exploded into rage about slaughtering all mother effing whores until she sprayed him with mace and got away. Now, news of the mutilation and murder spread quickly. Now, this sparked a wildfire of tips from people. Sure, they knew who committed these crimes, as we know happens. I mean, everybody wants to help. And, of course, obviously, as we always say, if you see something, say something. Right. Let the detectives figure it out. Now, amongst these tips that came in was a tip from Veronica Rodriguez. She, At the time, she was 26 years old. And she said she not only knew the killer's identity, but that she actually witnessed Pratt's murder. Now, Rodriguez, a prostitute, was well known to police. I mean, they knew who she was. 
And they had actually, the police had actually said that drugs had fried her brain and she lied consistently and was incoherent most of the time, wrote John Matthews. He's a detective on the case in the Eyeball Killer book, co-authored with Christine Wicker. Now, Rodriguez was so flaky that no one believed her horror story of how she and Pratt had gone off with a stranger for a threesome in a Dallas field. Rodriguez recalled that the man became violent and hit her in the head with a gun, briefly knocking her out. She said when she came to, just in time to see the man shoot Pratt, she bolted to the closest house where the occupant, a truck driver named Axton Schindler, let her in. Now, the house was sh- where Schindler was living belonged to another man. His name was Charles Albright. How weird is that? Can you imagine the irony of that? So we have Charles Albright who owns the home that she... One of his victims ran to. Exactly, who actually houses a man that is renting the house, or a room rather, from Charles Albright. An anonymous woman telephoned Dallas Deputy Constable Walter Cook. She said that she had been a friend of Mary Lou Pratt's and that... Prior to the deaths, she had gone home a couple of times with a guy who seemed unnaturally fixated on eyes. He also kept a stash of X-Acto knives in his attic. The caller identified the man as Charles Albright. More evidence soon came from Brenda White, age 37, a 20-year veteran of the streets. White said that one of her clients had tried to kill her and she got away only because of a can of mace. Rodriguez and White described their attacker as middle-aged with salt and pepper hair. Cook and another detective took Albright's photo around to the sex workers working in Oak Cliff. They identified him as the brutal attacker and the rapist. Now, on March 22nd of 1991, Albright's home in the 1000 block of El Dorado Avenue was raided by the police and searched. Now, in his home... They found a Smith & Wesson 44, and as we all know, several X-Acto knives because they said that they had them in the attic. They also found a red a condom in a red package. This was the same color condom found at Shirley Williams' crime scene. They found books about serial killers, as we mentioned earlier, and some not Nazi literature. Now, this was along with several dolls whose eyes had been removed. Imagine that. Basically, like taxidermy, just removing the eyes. He must have been practicing or something. Then, consequently, they found a pickup truck that had been stolen from Chevrolet in 1988. Now, he was taken in for questioning and questioned for seven hours, which sometimes it seems like they go like 36 hours or 24 hours. So seven hours at the time was probably a long time, but now I've seen some really, really awful cases where they keep him in there a long time. Now, at this particular time, he was not charged as the evidence from his home didn't completely link him to the case. However, it pushed the investigators further. Surprisingly, the 44 caliber gun that I mentioned that they found at his home was not the match for the gun that was used in the murders. So obviously, he's got multiple guns, if in fact it is Charles Albright. And Dixie, who knew nothing of his criminal activities until this time, swore up and down that he was home every single night, as she would because... Everything was normal because, remember, he was leaving to deliver papers. So in her mind, everything was normal. He was just going to work. In my mind, I mean, that's what I sort of deduce from the what I see here. Nonetheless, Albright was arrested on April 18th, 1991 for the murder of Shirley Williams, Mary Lou Pratt, and Susan Beth Peterson. Ultimately, the first two eyeball murders, Mary Lou Pratt and Susan Beth Peterson, were dropped. There simply wasn't enough evidence in those two cases. But everyone still knows that Albright was responsible. But hairs found at the Williams murder site matched Albright's hair. Weak evidence at best. Most of the evidence was actually completely circumstantial. But the jury found him guilty of the murder of Shirley Williams. He was sentenced to life in prison. Albright's defense tried to file an appeal, citing lack of evidence, but it was denied. (laughs) That makes me so angry about this case because it's like, okay, the MO is exact. The guy used a knife, precision. I mean, everything was exactly the same. So the only thing that you can really deduce from the whole thing is, okay, maybe he was a copycat. So we didn't catch the, you know, the or there were copycats. How is it possible that he gets arrested 
and convicted for one case but not the others. It happens a lot more than you think. I guess you're probably right. I just hate to think about it. But I guess, again, you know, technology has changed. So I guess if they – I mean, I know that they went through a lot of – I mean, if you if you look into this case, and we highly recommend that you do, they went through a lot of things. There was some discussion about a vacuum cleaner bag that found some hairs and fibers. So they had those tested because they were really trying to get him in there. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was found. But again, like you said, I guess maybe they just didn't connect it all to him or they couldn't do it evidence – I feel like that happens a lot in crime too. Yep. You know, there's same just, reason Casey Anthony got acquitted. Yeah, I mean, there's so like if you don't have the evidence, you don't have the evidence. If if you have a good criminal defense attorney who can, if you don't have solid evidence, any good criminal defense attorney can create reasonable doubt, and that's the basis with which you are convicted, either beyond a reasonable doubt. Or with reasonable doubt. And if there is reasonable doubt, you cannot convict. Well, I know that we've had multiple discussions on mic and off mic about it because it's like, you know, some prosecutors, I mean, they have all this evidence and all this stuff. But again, it's circumstantial. So they won't even try the case. Yeah. And it's like you get to see these people walk free. And I think a lot of times when you hear about these criminals that, you know, they get arrested, but then the charges are dropped. And you're like, oh, my God. And then later on in life, they finally get charged with something and there's plenty of evidence and they get convicted and there's no justice for everybody else. So I guess that makes sense in this case because it's kind of the same thing. I mean, even though we do know, we think we know, allegedly, that he was the murderer of, of this. And I'm convinced that there's probably more. Yeah, I, there I agree. There has to be more. I agree. But I think the MO might have been different because – the first one he gets, I mean, when he, I don't, I don't mean to put it that way, but the, the first murder that he commits, I should say rather, you know, the eyes are cut out with such precision. I got a feeling that he's practiced before. Maybe there was practice and nothing was found or, you know what I mean? There's just, I can't imagine that that was it. But thankfully, thankfully, and I only say this because the guy's a horrible, the guy's just horrible. If you really look into this case, you, you can really see just how awful this human is. While he was incarcerated, Albright died at the West Texas Regional Medical Facility in Lubbock, Texas in August of 2020. So not, not too long ago. No. I mean, we're talking two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. You know, he passed away and in prison because obviously he was doing life. So. His life wasn't that long, and that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I'm just sad. It was long. He, he was actually born in 1933, so. But, well, I'm saying, well, I guess so, but I'm saying from the conviction time, because what was that? He was convicted in 91. You know, I don't know if that's really enough time to really justify being in prison for someone that's a murderous piece of shit. All right, Lauren, is there anything else you want to add to the case? Nope, that's All it. Right. Well, I guess that's it for tonight, then. If you'd like to support our show... Please go ahead and subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And as mentioned in the beginning, please check out our website for all links to our social media, our merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And uh, as always, we'd like to thank you guys for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Duck, 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 duck.